Are you pleased with the maximum sentence? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the, for the victims. I think it brings never closure, but some acknowledgement. And I think particularly the, the statements from, from the judge who, who really seem to understand and the weight of, of the, uh, of these crimes. Um, and really put a, a fine point on the fact that Yes, it's an emotional, terrible tragedy, but the sentence and the convictions were based on facts and evidence. What did you make of both the Crumbly statements? Did you want to take that one? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, <clears throat> first I want to now acknowledge the victims. Their statements never cease to inspire, inspire me. Every time, I told them before we walked out here, I don't know how they're still on their feet after all of this and listening to all of their statements in, in this sentencing, in the shooter sentencing, it is so inspiring and their strength is, is really, really moves us. Listening to the crumbly statements I found to be uh, disappointing. I thought they were a, a additional um, examples of lack of remorse and um, blaming others. And what I was really hoping to hear, what the victims are really hoping to hear was accountability. And I thought that was lacking, and I thought Judge Matthews hit the nail on the head when she made her remarks at the end. What, what's, when's the first time they would become eligible for parole? The, the minimum sentence is 10 years. So after 10, after after 10 years, correct, with credit for their time with served. credit for time served. Yeah. Can you explain, there was like some back and forth about the no contact order, and you guys are going to be filing a motion about that. Can you explain what that was kind of about for today? Yes, I believe the argument is they, they want to be able to stay in contact with their son and with each other. Um, we maintain that we are going to take the same position we do um, in, in every case, and um, the Michigan Department of Corrections uh, has a no contact between co-defendants. So, so that's they can't contact each other or their son? The judge hasn't ruled on that yet, so she, she held that matter that's in advance. What you want. I, we want. We think the Crumbly should be treated just like any other defendant. I have a question. Is when Raina St. Juliana was speaking um, about um, Jennifer Crumbly's statement that she wouldn't have done anything differently, um, there was some kind of reaction from the defense table that she remarked on. She said, "Don't eye roll. It's on video." Who is who is rolling their eyes? She made the statement to one of the attorneys at the defense table. So you had a question? Yeah. Um, did it seem like uh, James and Jennifer Crumley, um, maybe they realized it and just don't want to take accountability for it, but that they were still saying that they were they were sorry, but not for the right things. It seemed like, um, uh, and I think Mark, you mentioned also, and maybe you Karen else, they're still trying to suggest that other people were to blame. Uh, now they're trying to somehow align themselves with the parents on going after the school. Um, and did, did it seem like that did them any favors there? I can tell you what I think, and I can tell you what the victims remarked to us after, which is, and I pointed this out in, in court, showing, feeling bad is, is natural, and we don't dispute that, that they feel bad. That's not, that's not what's important to victims of crime, and it's an essential part of our criminal justice system. The, the sentence should be fashioned in a proportional way, but what, what they want and need most of all is a remorse, which means acknowledgement of the wrongdoing and, and some sort of reconciliation or apology for that, and, and that didn't come. So, you know, I'll, I'll leave the Crumpleys to their own statements, and I, I agree with Mark, it's disappointing. I have one other question. On the depiction of the phone calls, um, Mary Lehman said that it's basically just venting um, and frustration and not an actual threat. What's your reaction to that? I think responding to that would uh, somehow give validity to the statement, and, and I don't believe there is one, and, and, and the statements speak for themselves. If your son uh, is, is not a co-defendant, and maybe this is something to be decided later, but uh, do you think James and Jennifer are co-defendants, we know that for sure, correct? Uh, the question is whether their son is a co-defendant. Uh, are you concerned that they may have contact with their son down the road and perhaps try to 
than ten minutes run away for appellate reasons. Well, the reason why the judge held that in, in abeyance is because it was a late objection, and, and the judge made note of that. So what we're going to do is coordinate with the Michigan Department of Corrections so we can review their policies as well, because he is a related defendant and is a bit of a unique situ situation. So we want to make sure that each defendant is treated the same as any other defendant in any criminal case. So we're going to ensure that happens. And I want to make one point on that. The, the defense stated that they have a constitutional right to be a family. And the, the, the parents in that courtroom have been deprived of their constitutional right to be parents. And so that matters. Can't imagine the pressure your office has been over the past few years. Side of relief tonight. That's a good question. Um, I I know that we did the absolute best that we could, and I know that the people sitting in that courtroom, uh, they know that we how hard we worked and how dedicated we we are to not just a a verdict that um, would would appease or, or make them feel even a little bit of acknowledgement, but also a fair and just prosecution. Um, but it's just, it's really difficult and it always has been for me to, um, to take a moment and, and talk about how hard it was for me or for us. And I know um, Lieutenant Tim Willis feels the same way as well, Special Agent Brett Brandon and Mark, of course, and our entire trial team. It's really hard to have, um, to remark about how hard we work and how hard it's been when you're looking in the eyes of these parents every day who get up in unbelievable pain and grief and and see this play out every day and they still go on and so my focus is there do you think that you've changed the way uh, the country now thinks about parental responsibility because of your case well, Charlie, I want to thank you for a story you did that meant a lot to me and the people on our team when you interviewed local gun shop owners who said that there was a rise in cable lock sales after the verdict of James Crumbly. And I can tell you that it was, that is, that has been, that was a moment of, of peace and, 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 and that's what we're here for. However, most parents don't need a message like that. Most, most parents don't need to have a message sending to, that, don't buy your, your son a, who's explain, um, exhibiting signs of distress, um, a 9 millimeter deadly weapon, and, and make it accessible. Most parents, most of us, don't need Karen McDonald or Mark Keast or anybody to tell them that. And they certainly don't need a jury to tell them that. However, I think it's the, the entire tragedy and, and how it unfolded and how it occurred does bring awareness. Um, and, you know, this is only the, 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 the beginning. We've, we've committed, I've committed to, to really address gun violence um, like it, it should be addressed, which is a public health crisis. And access to weapons is only one thing. And we have a lot more to do to educate the public on how to prevent gun violence because there's a lot we can do way before somebody gets their hand on a weapon, way before somebody even ends up in a state of crisis. And, and that, is, that is what I'm dedicated to doing going forward. You said of the verdicts, you know, this was an egregious case with egregious facts, um, and that those were precedent setting. You know, what precedent does this sentence now set? No, I, I actually don't, I don't really acknowledge it's precedent setting. Uh, there's a difference between precedent setting and rare. And this is really a rare set of facts. It really is. I think nobody standing here who's listened to any of it would say this is something that we see in the course of what we do. This is rare. This is egregious, and uh, two juries agreed, the judge agrees, and I think um, most of us know that you, we, you, you have to, to exercise ordinary care at least to prevent other people from, from the dangers that you, you know are foreseeable. With the new safe storage law uh, that recently went into effect, um, would a case like this, and God forbid it's never a case like this, but uh, a case where a child gets a hold of a gun and causes harm to someone else or themselves, um, will it be easier, because obviously this was a monumental task for you guys to try these cases, but will it be much easier uh, to prosecute individuals who are irresponsible with their firearms? You know, I, I think the thing I'm focused on is, is a different question, which is what and how much it will um, do to prevent, right? So that, that we don't 
we don't have to assess whether it's a more useful tool to prosecute. The safe storage law is just bringing awareness so that we can prevent access to guns. The number one cause of death in this country is gun violence to children. It's the number one cause of death, and over 50% of that is suicide. So access to weapons is key. It's not everything in prevention, but safe storage is, is definitely critical. So There is a legal component to it, though. I mean, and so sometimes the message is sent with that legal attachment to it. Do you think that awareness of knowing that they can be charged um, uh, obviously will keep down uh, the number of cases that you get, but may also inspire people to uh, make sure they're not on the other side of the law. I absolutely think it will, will inspire people, educate, and they're more conscious of it. Uh, this type of set of facts, though, is so rare. It would be, you know, a, a violation of your duty to, to secure your firearm and all of the other things that made it foreseeable that a death or, or serious harm would occur, which is so rare. But in general, yes, this is part, it's, it's now a law, and, and most of us want to want to follow the law. So I think it's important. One more question. Your message to the community as you've been shepherding this for the last two and a half years, do you think that this will be the ultimate deterrent in, you know, for the community? With this? My message to the community is don't look away. These were tragic and awful, awful uh, deaths and what these families have gone through, and it is preventable. It is preventable. That is my message. Thank you. Thank you.